Hi, I uh, wanted to do a quick video to talk a little bit about anti-counterfeiting. Uh, I got a question on YouTube uh, that asked specifically, how are we going to actually develop a hardware-based anti-counterfeiting solution? Uh, and what is the University of Wyoming Laboratory doing? Uh, so I figured to actually approach that question, it would be fun to do a whiteboard video and discuss a bit about it. So let's go ahead and turn on the presentation. Share. Okay, I should be presenting in a moment. Good. And open up the whiteboard application. Cool. All right. So let's say that you have a handbag. And that handbag, uh, it lives in a supply chain. So there are stages in that supply chain. And eventually you get to the retail endpoint. So what happens is that as your handbag goes from each stage of that supply chain, things can go wrong. Uh, counterfeits can be made, uh, they can be stolen, all kinds of crazy shenanigans happen. And where you introduce the anti-counterfeit uh, solutions uh, is an uh, open question. And generally speaking, it's um, not standardized amongst uh, all these different retailers. So Gucci and LMVH and Rolex and all these other vendors may have different ideas about what to do. And those are things like invisible inks, uh, you know, holographic tags, uh, serial codes, and uh, there are many other things that they can introduce. And the idea there is that there usually are some special group of people that live within the supply chain, special, uh, who add in the authentication anti-counterfeiting component. Uh, because the factories that manufacture the uh, luxury good, in some cases, they actually run additional shifts, even though they're not supposed to, and they'll actually make counterfeit goods. Uh, so there is usually some sort of segregation here. So trillion dollar business, when you think about counterfeiting and authentication, you know, how do you know something is real? And there's all kinds of really cool ideas and techniques that people have come up with. And the things that I've just mentioned, uh, they're like serial codes and inks and holographic tags. They're kind of uh, early generation stuff. And there's even more sophisticated things that have been coming online over the last 10 or 15 years. The problem is that most of these solutions are not really consumer friendly. So for example, if you buy uh, this handbag you, the consumer, will see stuff on it, like maybe you'll see a serial code or you know, there'll be a certificate of authenticity or something like that. But how do you actually know that that corresponds to something real? You actually don't. And so the naive approach would be for the consumer to go straight to the manufacturer of the handbag and say, is it real? Yeah, Chanel or Gucci or what have you. And a lot of cases, they actually explicitly say on their website, we don't authenticate our products. So you can't just walk into the Louis Vuitton store and say, hey, is this a real Louis Vuitton bag or not? More often than not, they're just simply not going to tell you. You could try to get a domain expert, some special person to come on in. I'll give him a little bit of a beard because let's say this guy's been doing it for a while. And a little bit of a cane. There we go. And that domain expert perhaps could look at it and think about it, authenticate it. Uh, but even there, these fakes that are being made are sometimes being made in the same factories that uh, by the same people that actually make uh, the original handbag. So even the domain expert can be fooled sometimes. So this is a really interesting, really challenging problem of how do you handle product authentication and anti-counterfeiting. So what we're going to be doing at the University of Wyoming, UYO, lab is that we're going to investigate designing a chip. And that chip is basically going to be a special purpose piece of silicon. 
And the idea is that it's a secure hardware module. And it's capable of several cryptographic operations. And you can think of things like Intel SGX as an example of this. You can think of things like ARM Trust Zone. Uh, these are examples of trusted hardware modules uh, built within either uh, microprocessors directly or connected to them. Uh, you can think of all kinds of trusted hardware set setups. But basically, the idea is that you have some secure circuits that are kind of tamper resistant. So when you're playing around with it, it's difficult to actually extract things from that chip. And uh, they're isolated from the rest of the operating system. And basically, you can then use this to store and use private keys. OK. And now, what makes this so desirable is that these chips, once you've designed them, can be very small, like very small. Like there can be that big, that small. And they also can have things like NFC or RFID, all kinds of cool antenna stuff that they do. And they can be extremely cheap, like one cent to make. They can be very, very cheap to make. And they don't have to have a lot of power. In fact, using modern fabrication technology and modern chip design, uh, you can basically build these super cheap chips that are very powerful for uh, signing and storing uh, signal signature and transmitting that. So it's actually quite uh, amazing to see what you can do um, these days with uh, not a lot of power, not a lot of uh, expense. OK, and probably more like 10 cents You know, once you start adding more and more features to it. OK, so the idea is that the UYO lab is going to explore all the business and technical requirements behind building something that lives within a reasonable cost window. We'll set some sort of price x dollars per unit. And we'll create a big laundry list of explicit capabilities here. And the first part of the engagement is to basically get those explicit capabilities and to figure out what that price window is going to be and to understand how the outside world is going to communicate and to really define how small it needs to be and to come up with a design philosophy of how we ensure that these things are correct. Uh, and then also, uh, how much memory does the chip need and how much computing power does the chip need? And that's really the first step is that prototype step. Uh, and the point is just to get a better understanding of these things. Uh, and then after that's done, actually go from you know, requirements and then build a prototype. And this is an iterative process. So there will be many prototypes that are generated. And then eventually, we'll send to finisher. And a finisher is basically a special lab, a special uh, business that it will take this from something that's an academic project and turn it into something that we can mass manufacture and commercialize. Now, all of this work that we're doing at that lab is open source. And it's intended to be used within the Cardano ecosystem. So we can store private keys and we can sign things, but how do we actually use this hardware to examine the problem above this issue of the handbag or the shoes or the watch or any of these things? Well, here's how we do it as a straw man solution. And straw man basically means that it's an avenue to be beaten up and examined and played around with until we come up with a better solution. So straw man v1. So you have Cardano. And Cardano very soon is going to have a multi-asset standard, either during the Shelley or the Gogan era. And what you're going to do is you're going to issue an authentication token. Okay, 
And that's going to be done by a special role in the supply chain. We'll call it the authenticator. So the authenticator. Give him a little monocle. There we go. All right. And when you create that handbag, somewhere in the supply chain, the handbag is going to get that chip inserted in it. Somewhere in the handbag. Then the authenticator, somewhere later in the supply chain, will examine the handbag, the history, all these things. And once he's satisfied with it, he's going to say, Okay, it's good. And then issue a transaction sending one of the authentication tokens to the TPM. Now, once that private key has been encumbered with that asset, it can't be removed because you can't move the private key. You can't get it out of the chip. It's been secured if the chip is correctly designed. However, you can institute a protocol of challenge response. So basically how that works is that once you have the handbag, we'll actually use consistent colors for this. Once you have the handbag, with the chip, with the token, then what the questioner can do with his or her cell phone is tap the phone on the bag. And maybe NFC or RFID or some standard will be used for that. And then what happens is it asks, are you real? And really the mechanical question is, do you have a legit token? Okay. And basically to answer yes, you have to provide a signature from a recognized token. Okay. So they tap the phone and then the chip will generate a signature and then return that query to the questioner. And then the questioner is able to look at the Cardano blockchain and say, well, does this exist? And if it does, check. They actually know that a legitimate token on a legitimate TPM uh, has answered the question. And so it gives them a high degree of certainty uh, that that bag is real. Now, we'll get into some attacks and other things in a moment. And uh, we also uh, have the opportunity to discuss something, in particular, uh, metadata. So in addition to storing the private key for uh, a token, you also can store the history of the object. Things like where it was made, uh, what store it was sold at, the ownership list, all kinds of things could potentially be stored as an optional field in the design of the system. So you can actually see a beautiful chain of custody. For example, 
uh, maybe this handbag was owned by a famous actress, or maybe this handbag um, came from a special edition line and was uh, showcased in a, in a very uh, prestigious event or something like that. You'd actually have that entire chain of history follow it. Now, there is one little kink in the straw man proposal, and it's something we are going to think about and address as we're designing the chip, which is what if somebody was to, and this is what the questioner asked, remove the chip. Now, this doesn't really help a counterfeiter too much. And here's the reason being, because if you remove the chip, then you could conceivably put the chip into a new handbag. And then, yes, you could fool somebody into believing that that particular handbag was legitimate. But it is a one-to-one -one situation, meaning that you actually have to have a real bag to make a fake bag. The whole point of counterfeiting is counterfeiting is a one to many endeavor. Uh, so for every one Louis Vuitton or Gucci or Christian Dior that's made, there'll be hundreds, if not thousands of counterfeits made. And, and the counterfeits are usually sold at a much lower cost than the primary real purse. The fact that you could only make one counterfeit for one legitimate product is actually a big improvement. And it gets a little bit better too. You see, you could also conceivably build pairs of chips and you could put a secret chip that regularly communicates with the other chip that's used for authentication. And uh, the people would not know which chip is which. But if the chips are no longer in communication, this can have a timer and it would basically erase its key. You could do something like that or you could even put all kinds of other anti-tamper uh, situations. So there's tons of cool things that you can kind of dream up and if your chips are cheap, and they can talk to each other, and they can do kinds of cool things. Uh, then it's uh, then it's certainly uh, a, a a great avenue to go down. Uh, but this is a major step forward because it's something that is easy to manufacture. It's easy to embed in a product uh, by separating the authenticator from the manufacturer. Uh, you basically have oversight in the supply chains. And these chips are programmable and the feature richness of them can be improved over time. So they can have more and more sophisticated cryptographic protocols and you're creating a situation where the consumer can now directly interact with the product. Uh, and all kinds of additional things could potentially be stored there. For example, at the retail point, you could have a master key that or you know some process you don't even necessarily need that degree of centralization where when uh, somebody buys the good there's a transaction that's issued to add metadata to the luxury good okay and by doing that, then that actually becomes your certificate of authenticity and proof of ownership. So this is kind of like a blockchain-based registration system to register a product to a person. So it ceases to be a Christian Dior handbag. It's Alice's Christian Dior handbag. And then when Alice goes to resell that, you can talk about transferable warranties, you could talk about potentially secondary market royalties, you could talk about reauthentication. authentication uh, there's all kinds of really cool things that can be done. You can also have loyalty systems. So for example, Alice is able to prove that she indeed owns a Christian Jewel product. And so by doing that, then you can actually have 
custom products or rare products that only verified owners can have. For example, let's say you drive Lamborghinis. So Lamborghini has a, and this is my terrible car drawing. So Lamborghini makes special edition Lamborghinis, like the Reviton, for example. And uh, they're very rare, and they only will do a production run of maybe a few hundred, if that. And uh, they usually have a lottery system. And that lottery system basically says, hey, uh, we uh, uh, are only going to allow registered users, uh, registered buyers uh, who have proven they actually own a Lamborghini to even have a chance to own one of these super rare special edition Lamborghinis. Okay, well, these same types of loyalty systems could be redeployed and redeployed so that you can conduct that lottery amongst everybody uh, who's registered inside the system, has a digital identity within the system, and then let's say Jim wins. Uh, Jim gets to buy a Reviton or you know, the super special edition. But what if Jim doesn't want it? Because he has that asset, the right to buy, if that's tokenized, then it can be resold. So basically what Lamborghini just did to Jim is they gave him free money because Jim can go and sell it to Jack and Jack can buy it maybe for $50,000 or something like that. And that costs Lamborghini nothing. Jack is willing to pay the markup because he wants the special edition car and that asset can be transferred from Jim to Jack. Okay. So there's all kinds of really cool overlay loyalty systems that can be added in once you have the ability to have self-authenticating bags and you have the ability to pair identity to the ownership and then create loyalty and membership systems. Uh, and these things can just build and build and build and build and they have all kinds of really cool benefits to the consumer uh, from being able to verify that the products that they have are legitimate uh, to getting better consumer protections uh, in the secondary market uh, to the original IP originators or manufacturers to potentially having transitive revenue lines in the secondary market to things like being able to monetize the fact that you are a loyal customer of a particular firm. And a lot of these use cases will be enabled, especially when we talk about uh, luxury goods like uh, handbags and watches and shoes and these things at the consumer level by building a beautiful little chip like this. Uh, so this is what the lab is basically gonna look like. And obviously there are some other attack vectors that can exist. Uh, however, uh, as I mentioned, this is a straw man solution and it's probably gonna take quite a bit of time to design the chip and then build better solutions along the way. Uh, but this is what the University of Wyoming Lab is going to do. And what's great is it's a public-private partnership. So we've donated uh, 505000 to that lab. The government is matching. And there's a very high probability that year after year, uh, the government of Wyoming will continue matching uh, and that we'll be able to federate and add more members. Given that the output of this is going to be open source, uh, everybody in the Cardano ecosystem will be able to use this chip kind of like a reference design for Raspberry Pi or something like that, where it's basically it's open hardware. And that open hardware can be used for a variety of purposes. If the chip is sufficiently powerful, we could also put the chip in something like a USB key, and then we could use this for one-time signatures. So basically, after a stake pool signs, the chip will generate a proof of secure erasure that it destroyed the key that was used to sign. We also developed a really cool thing called one-shot signatures, which involves quantum crypto. The great paper that we wrote out of Princeton and University of Edinburgh, our chief scientist wrote it, Agolos Kiasis, with several other authors. And there's an idea that perhaps we could even include in future versions of this platform, these types of capabilities. So just starting with something very simple, like let's just think about how to build a chip. We'll gradually get our 1.0 requirements. And once we're happy, we'll build many prototypes out of this facility. And then eventually we'll send it to a finisher. Uh, and, and because it's very low cost, this can be bundled as part of a larger product authentication scheme. 
So very likely that this will be coupled with our identity solution called Prism, which is also being deployed on Cardano, and its foundation is based on the DID. Uh, and this will be paired with the Cardano multi-asset standard that is coming soon. So people can issue authentication tokens and uh, all kinds of things. And then you go from a situation of one to many from counterfeiting to one to one for counterfeiting. Okay, that's a huge improvement already. Uh, as assuming, of course, the, that the issuer of the tokens is uh, being honest, but there's social processes and business processes that can be put there to ensure that um, that token issuer is actually sending tokens to the right uh, handbags. And you're kind of trusting the manufacturer to you know, make your good. So there is always going to be some degree of centralization there. Uh, and then uh, later on, you can create pairs of chips or N chips, and you can create all kinds of cool little patterns, uh, even decoy chips. Uh, for example, you can have three or four identical chips, but you don't know which one actually has the token. All kinds of stuff there uh, to, uh, to do that. And then, of course, you can add in other things. Uh, because there's a metadata field, you can add in machine learning in the supply chain, and then you can even create a probability of authentication. So the signature is only one component, but there can be other components such as geography. Like for example, if the last time the purse was seen uh, was in the United States and there was no clear way it moved from US to let's say China, if it's seen again in China, then there's an issue there and it would be able to flag something. So depending upon the robustness of the infrastructure around the system uh, and the metadata that's stored, you can do all kinds of really cool things with that. Now, as a final point, kind of close this off, uh, the beauty of these types of systems is that they're layered, they're composable, and they use solid foundations. So nothing that I've proposed here is revolutionary, but it's the emergence of combining a blockchain with a trusted hardware module with a cell phone app. These components together, when you start adding, and of course crypto, lots of cryptography, when you start adding these components together, that's where the solution gets very robust and resilient. Uh, and because it's composable, you can keep adding more and more sophisticated solutions depending upon the value of the product. And you also, because you know that Cardano is awesome and you know that the chip was properly designed and you know that the token issuing system is uh, very nicely designed and you trust crypto, uh, you know that the foundations are very solid there as a consumer. And most importantly of all of this, is scale. This is a super cheap system to implement because when you think about the cost of adding a chip into this, you know, that's probably less than 10 cents, give or take. Depends on the cost of the chip and a lot, litany of other factors, even if it's a dollar, let's say, for the sake of the argument, which is probably too much, but let's say it's a dollar. The handbacks are sold retail for thousands of dollars. Rolexes can be sold for $50,000. Uh, even a cheap Submariner is looking at over $10,000 per unit. So an additional dollar, that's not really a huge cost increase to the product line. And the systems are self-maintaining. Uh, these tokens are issued on the Cardano network. Ch check. So it, all the accounting is done for free, and it's global. So you have one space for all consumers, which that means that authentication app is not a Gucci app. It's not an LMVH app. Yeah, it's not a, an app for you know Rolex. It's a universal app. And so all luxury brands actually are using a common framework. And that means you as the consumer can't be shut out of that system. Uh, basically, you're always able to verify that that data is there and you can transparently see these coins. Uh, and you can do all kinds of cool things with these authentication tokens. So uh, you actually can prove uh, the unit amount. 
So if there's 50,000 tokens issued, there should only be up to 50,000 of these purses existing in the world, for example. And if you see new tokens being issued, it goes from 50,000 to 75,000, you as the consumer know that there's a mismatch on the product run. They say there's 50,000, but there's only 75,000. And later with privacy preserving systems, you could even imagine a situation in the distant future where you could issue tokens and you don't actually know how many of these certificates exist, for example. Uh, so there's all kinds of really cool things that, uh, that can be done there. Um, also, it gives a channel for the manufacturer or the authenticator, whoever controls those, uh, who, who issued those tokens, uh, to actually be able to additionally communicate with uh, the buyer of that. So once, for example, Alice is uh, tethered, uh, where do we put Alice? Uh, here we go. Tethered to that particular handbag. Let's say that you want to have a coupon system where you push to Alice uh, discounts for buying additional products or services within that ecosystem, but she has to prove that she's a verified buyer. She's actually able to do that because she has the handbag tethered to her identity. So you can do all kinds of loyalty systems with that. So this is what we're basically looking at. It's a big project. There's a lot to do. It's a you know academic partnership. It's a private partnership. Uh, and our people will certainly be working with their people, and it's going to take some time to spin it up and spool it up. So this is beyond 2020, but we're getting it started now. And this is just a great example of a real-life use case and how a real-life use case comes together. You see, once you have great foundations like PRISM and the Cardano blockchain and our multi-token standard, then it's incredibly easy to compose those systems, which are very complex in their core, uh, so that you can abstract away a lot of complexity for the consumer and get it down to a situation where they can just simply tap something. And the fact that we can go from a one-to-many counterfeit situation to with just a straw man solution, a one-to-one -one counterfeit solution, with all kinds of potential approaches to mitigate that further and secondary protections can still be added in like holographic stickers and uh, secret ink and things like that as a uh, uh, you know uh, authentication of last resort uh, it's really cool that that can be added in and uh, the fact that we can layer loyalty systems and we can do all kinds of cool things with the consumer this way and that this system once it's put together uh, doesn't actually have to be owned or controlled by one luxury goods manufacturer Rather, it can be a universal system for all luxury goods manufacturers, small and large, is exactly why blockchain exists. People often ask, why don't we use a centralized database? Well, if it's just Gucci, then do that. Uh, but if it's Gucci and 400 other companies, who controls that database? And so that's why you have something like a blockchain-based solution. And this is why we think of these types of things. So this is kind of authentication in a nutshell. And uh, there's certainly a lot more to say about it, a lot more to think about it, how to build a proper trusted hardware module. That's a hard, hard challenge. And it's an academic question as much as it is a hard engineering question. Uh, and how to transform that so it can be reused for state pools or other people and embedded in different situations is really interesting. We've also had discussions about putting it into a bio package so that it can be implanted in agriculture. So for example, you can put this into cows, you can put this into sheep, other animals, and you carry their medical history uh, from the vaccines they've gotten to whether they've treated with antibiotics or not. And you can even use it as a metadata store and basically when they were feeded, how they were feeded, these types of things. And if combined with even more sophisticated capabilities, eventually it could be an IoT product that can even record where the cows went. And you get a sense if they were truly grass fed or free range. And the consumer through that same mechanism of challenge response and our metadata standards that we're coming up to would be able to verify these types of things. So the sky's really the limit. And this is a long-term relationship, so we're going to have generations of these things. So there'll be version one of the chip and version two and version three, and it'll just be a permanent thing that we do for a long time, hopefully. Uh, and we'll just keep making it better, more secure, more feature-rich. And, of course, it's always going to come coupled with PRISM 
And it's always going to come coupled with a lot of the other things that uh, we've been building for the Cardano ecosystem, both public and otherwise. Uh, so that's authentication in a nutshell. I hope that answers the question. It's not a perfect situation, but remember, it's always a game. Uh, the counterfeiter and the authenticator, and the, you know, it's it's a little war between them, and they fight every day over it. Uh, but uh, the, the magic of this solution is that it's a big improvement already over a pretty bad situation, and it's an improvement that, for the first time ever, allows consumers to be able to verify uh, that the things that they look at are real and do that with just a tap of their phone. And that's a pretty cool step forward. All right. So thank you so much for listening. This was a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll do more of these product workshops. And I hope you guys learned a few things along the way. Cheers. <laughs>